morning, Joyce. Good morning. Yeah, this is John Ondrick, and uh, I'm talking to uh, Joyce Ballman from National City Mortgage Services. And uh, Joyce averages about four million a month, and uh, is a very high producer, and also has some uh, unusual quality in that she has some longevity in this career too. I believe you have about 22 years in the business. That is correct. Um, the first question I always uh, ask out of the gate is, uh, how'd you get where you are, and uh, when did you start? Um, well, I started out in the savings and loan industry, and um, at that time, loans and savings were tied together. So as a assistant manager or a um, loan officer of a branch, you were involved in, in both ends of the transaction. Um, in the very late 70s, early 80s, the institution that I worked for broke the two apart, and uh, the savings area had their own individuals, and the loan area um, went on their own. And, and at that point, I became a uh, mortgage loan officer. Uh, when when you did this, this was, uh, what, I guess about 22 years ago, did you go through the SNL crisis, or uh, this take place sometime a little bit later? Uh, there really wasn't any, in, in our institution, we really didn't have any, any crisis situation. We didn't have... Um, interest rates that were not covered and, and loans that were not mm -hmm. covered, so our institution was safe. I see. You just went, went, went along your merry way, huh? Exactly. Uh, well, when you start, what, what is your market area, by the way? You mean in, ter um, in Dayton, Ohio? Of, yeah, in, in Dayton, Ohio. Yes. Uh, and have you uh, operated out of the Dayton area for most of your career? All of my career. All your career. Uh, born and raised and went to school there, too, the whole shebang? Uh, no, I actually raised in St. Louis, but uh, graduated from a local high school here in Dayton. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all of my uh, my uh, couple of years of education out of um, out of Dayton, but uh, most, of, uh, most of my life uh, since 1969 has been spent in Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me ask you about your uh, your early career just a little bit. Um, it, it was far enough back we, we won't dwell too much on it, but uh, when you started off in the mortgage side of the business, uh, were you did you do it the traditional route where you were dealing with realtors, or uh, did you do it with uh, new homes, or how did you start your business? Uh, very traditional with real estate agents and um, just developing relationships and also developing relationships with customers that ultimately uh, led me to many transactions time and again with those same individuals. Uh, and then I guess uh, uh, I'm going to assume that you some of the same realtors maybe you have today? A lot of them are the same realtors I have today. Some have retired at this point, some have moved, uh, and of course I've, I've grown from that, that base, but I do still have some original realtors that uh, started working with uh, pretty much from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You said that you've grown from this original base. Uh, if we can kind of update the conversation and take it into today, um, in today's arena, uh, exactly how is your business split up? Is it uh, still primarily realtors, or are you now dealing primarily in referrals? Um, I'm about 50-50. I would say about 50% of the business I get comes from realtors, and about 50% comes from uh, real referrals from past clients, friends, and uh, acquaintances. Mm -hmm. Do you have a database? How do you keep that track of all your people? We do. Uh, I do have a da database. I have an assistant who helps me keep track of that. Um, before I had someone to help me keep track of it, though, I pretty much uh, kept my own da database and, and kept the information on my past clients. But that's only been going on since uh, probably the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's essential to have one in today's environment? Yes, I do. I do. I definitely do. How, how do you use your database? Um, for mailings and uh, also having the information available when a client comes back to me either to refinance or purchase their next home. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to switch in and talk a little bit about the realtors that you're dealing with today. And I guess um, uh, what I would like to know is uh, your kind of your personal habits uh, in your dealing with realtors. Um, do you still get out and do you call in the offices or uh, pretty much is that over too? Uh, no, I, I do not call on offices. Um, if I'm out taking a loan application, of course I do visit with the real estate agents, and there are a lot of realtors that I do um, 
socialize with just because of friendships that have developed over the years. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's kind of two schools of thought. Uh, um, of the interviews that I do, I'd say about half actually develop uh, rather deep uh, social relationships with their uh, realtors over a period of time, and then there's others that um, <clears throat> prefer to keep it more on a, a professional basis and uh, on purpose. And uh, so, do you keep a, a social relationships uh, primarily, or? I, I'd say it's about fifty-fifty, and it's just a matter of uh, <clears throat> rapport, um, but. I would say all in all, I have a fairly strong relationship with almost all the agents that I do a fair amount of business with. Mm -hmm. What about the, because um, uh, there's a lot of listeners out there today that are uh, young loan officers, they're new, they're just getting started, and I wondered if we could kind of turn the direction of this a little bit and perhaps uh, talk about some of the things that you do uh, in your professional career that you would recommend to the new people out there who uh, either having a tough time where they're just getting started, uh, but are in, in the early stages of their careers? Um, well, I think the most important thing is um, doing exactly, uh, following through and doing exactly what you say you're going to do. Um, most of what I hear from uh, agents in terms of their frustration with either new uh, loan officers or not so successful loan officers uh, would be that they're not kept informed. These individuals don't follow through. They promise more than they can um, possibly accomplish. And um, I think it's a credibility issue. A uh, real estate agent has their work to do, and uh, they don't want to do the loan officer's work as well or have to worry about whether the loan officer is doing their job. So I think that is uh, absolutely the most important um, key to being successful is developing um, a reputation as being someone who is honest and um, works hard and stays on top of things and gets things done. Yeah, that, that's easier said than done, though. I, I think there's a lot of people out there that, that hear that, uh, but I'm not sure they they understand that in the sense of what really the depth of the commitment that's needed. And uh, uh, do you find that you're running into a lot of new loan officers out there yourself that you know, all of a sudden they're just missing. Uh, they come in for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I, I know that scares uh, realtors to death uh, that people are going to, you know, show up for a couple of months and then all of a sudden they just disappear. I, I think that's um, uh, definitely a problem, um, and a lot of realtors are, are concerned about that. We, we do see a lot of loan officers that don't make it. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that think this job looks easy. They think it looks like um, fast, uh, good money, and um, they don't realize the commitment you have to make. You have to be uh, an individual who doesn't mind getting phone calls late at night, early in the morning, on weekends. Um, you have to be an individual who's willing to keep long hours uh, into the evening to meet with applicants. Um, if a loan officer is not available, most of the time, they won't get any business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a, a couple of recurring threads that go through the interviews I do, uh, but I think um, uh, one overall, uh, one overall one, which is in relationships, of course, but also I think uh, an underlying theme is being available. I, I think the people that I talk to, the interview, the successful people I talk to. Um, they all seem to be available, uh, whether it's uh, day or night, or they have everything uh, planned so that they can respond. And uh, I just wondered if you, you you might go over that a little bit more in depth and, and just what that kind of commitment entails. Well, um, I think voicemail is very important. Um, I happen to not use a pager um, other than so my family can reach me. Um, I know a lot of loan officers have voicemail that um, goes ahead and, and um, activates their pager so that they know they have a voicemail. I just check my voicemail all the time. Plus, I always have the option to go to an assistant. And um, then in terms of during the weekends, I check my voicemail uh, usually every couple of hours. So. I know there are people that probably keep themselves even a little bit more available with pagers, but I feel that's carrying it a little bit too far. As long as I'm checking my voicemail and getting back to real estate agents very quickly on the weekends, I think that's enough. 
Um, but uh, it's it's all a matter of um, being able to you know respond to the phone calls that come in in a timely manner and and make sure I know there's certain days of the week that the phone calls are are so strong and and so fast and uh, so many at a time that it's hard to get people uh, get back to people in a timely manner. So sometimes you have to choose what's uh, the most important at that particular time and have someone help you return those phone calls. Mm-hmm. Mike Twig, who's a, a regional manager um, in the Warsaw metropolitan area, uh, he has a theory that it, it's not radical, it's not unique, and it's not even unusual. Uh, but his theory is, is that um, uh, loan officers need to go after what he calls uh, the centers of influence, uh, those realtors who... Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll not drag a loan officer along, give them a deal once every three or four months, but go after those people uh, that uh, not only can you develop relationships, but who will give you considerable business. I think that's very important. I agree with that. You do. Uh, did you do that yourself when you started, or do you do that now? Um, I did that when I started, and, and I still do that. Um, most of the agents that I do business with, I get uh, a very large percentage of their business. I do have some agents that I've developed relationships with over the years that have a tendency to spread themselves between two or three loan officers, but I found um, that on the important transactions, the the ones that they think are a little bit more difficult or the personality of the individual needs a little bit more hand-holding, that I always get those deals. And why do you think that is? I mean, there has to be specific reasons why they gravitate to you, um, besides longevity, well, which, which does count, of course. Well, but. and I, I think it's partially my reputation for getting the job done, and I think it's partially um, because I really do empathize with my clients and get very close to the people I do business with. And there are some loan officers out there, although they're good technicians, they don't, uh, and, and they follow up and, and they do a good job, they don't, um, they don't develop the relationships with their clients. And there are a lot of people that are nervous. Yeah, usually first-time home buyers are nervous, but even second- and third-time home buyers can be very nervous about the transaction. And if they're dealing with a loan officer that really is um, not too connected to them, it, it can be a situation that um, is is not uh, quite as comfortable as they want it to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. I think the relationships uh, really uh, fundamentally uh, fundamentally uh, go to the core of our business uh, in our industry, uh, and that if you cannot develop these relationships, if you cannot be empathetic, uh, if you cannot you know return their calls and hold their hands, uh, ultimately, you're doomed to failure, and, and you're the first person that's actually used the word technician in all the uh, the interviews that I've done, and, and I find that that's actually a marvelous word, and I, I think it really sums up some of the problems that uh, loan officers have today where they, as you say, they almost become too clinical about it and, and don't focus on the individuals involved in the transaction, whether they're customers or whether they're realtors. Exactly. Um, the relationships that you have developed with your clients and, and with your realtors over the year, over the years, uh, is it based on the fact that you you think you have an outgoing personality, or are you kind of a A plus extrovert, or you know where do you kind of fit on the scale? Well, I I do have an outgoing personality, but I do really enjoy people, and um, I, I'm interested in in seeing that people are able to achieve what they want in terms of their home purchases. I, probably sometimes I get a little bit too involved in the individuals, but um, that's uh, always been the way that I've been since the, the time I started doing the loan applications. I really do like people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we all have those clients that are much more difficult to deal with and a lot more difficult to, to like, and maybe in many instances you don't like them. But... Um, most of the people that I do business with, I really do develop a relationship and, and consider them almost a friend. And in some cases, I do consider them a, f- a friend mm-hmm. in the end. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you take us through a, a typical process um, when you get a call from a realtor. And by that, I mean uh, where I'm heading is do you ultimately end up uh, do, doing a lot of FaceTime with the realtor? Do you do a lot of FaceTime 
uh, with the client? Do you take the apps yourself uh, in hand? You know, those kind of issues to develop the relationship. That's really the overall umbrella here. Well, actually, at this point, because I do have those relationships developed with the realtors, in many cases, um, they're calling up and scheduling the appointment or having the customer call and schedule the appointment. And sometimes the realtor comes and sometimes the realtor doesn't come. Um, Most of them feel comfortable enough about how I'm going to handle the transaction that they don't feel the need to uh, go to the appointment as well. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Not that many appointments are actually scheduled in the real estate offices anymore, and I think that's partially because of the fact that um, a lot of the real estate companies have um, started their own mortgage companies, and so most of the realtors don't want anyone in their office to see that they're still not supporting their uh, company real estate office. Good um, observation. I like that. Or right. mortgage office, sure. I guess I should say. So um, they're sending people uh, to our location, which makes it a lot easier for me. I don't have all the travel time I used to have and, and bringing, uh, breaking down my computer and taking it with me. Um, but I, I do take all my loan own loan applications. I do have an assistant that... Uh, just because I'm training her to be a loan officer, I will probably start having her do uh, a large portion of my loan application and then coming in and meeting with the people. I, and I, I'm sure I could do a whole lot more volume if I'd have someone else take my loan applications for me, but I don't know how a loan officer develops a relationship with a client unless they sit across the table from them face-to-face. I don't think if you have your assistant take... Um, a loan application for you, and then all you do is call the customer to tell them they're approved, that you can develop any kind of relationship or rapport with that customer to expect that when they buy the next house, they want to come back to you. I, um, I'm sure there's some magic that I'm missing here because there are loan officers all over the country that have two and three assistants taking loan applications for them, and they're very, very successful. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm sure I could do more business, but I, I, I just can't grasp that um, uh, that philosophy at all. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, again, I'm probably missing out on something, but I still like to meet face to face with my own clients. Yeah, I'm not sure you really are. I think you actually have it right. I mean, in terms of sales, if you uh, look at the sales pyramid, uh, nothing really beats being at the top and being able to shake somebody's hand and look in their eyes and ask some direct questions. And you're right, if you want to form a deep relationship, uh, nothing will ever be as good, not that it doesn't work another way, uh, as being there doing the apps. Uh, one of the loan officers I uh, talked to not too long ago, he purposely uh, leaves his computer outside the office and comes in and still, t- even the, even if he has all the information, he still will sit down and go over and take a hand uh, 10.03 just so we can have time to banner back and forth uh, with the clients. Yeah. Uh, he thinks that a computer, you're sometimes turned a little bit sideways and candid and you're typing in, and uh, at times it's difficult. So he, he takes it a little bit to an extreme, but uh, I think the point is uh, is well taken. And I think also that it leads into uh, other issues that uh, uh, that help a loan loss or two, and that is uh, one that comes uh, easily to mind is pricing. Uh, pricing can always be an issue in our business, as you well know, uh, and if you have a relationship, when things get a little tight or you're a quarter point higher and uh, they want to lock or something, uh, if you have that relationship, it, it certainly is going to make it a lot easier at that time. I believe so. Uh, let, let me ask you, though, since I, since I brought, brought the thing up, uh, it's not too often I actually do talk about pricing in interviews, uh, but, uh, but I would like to talk about pricing with you and how you feel about it and um, uh, you know, with respect to is lowest best, and how do you survive in an environment where you're you're never lowest? And, and the emphasis that, that pricing uh, uh, seems to have to, in today's environment now, I think people are a little more price sensitive. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I definitely would agree. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is price should never be the issue. Uh, most lenders are going to be um, in the ballpark, pretty close to the same rate. Um, if, if everything is, is calculated out correctly. Um, if, if an individual goes out there looking for the best price and uh, 
many times they can get swindled by um, a company out there that's not so reputable that is trying to capture the market in a uh, not from reputation but uh, just one transaction at a time with no care as to whether they get another transaction from that individual or not. We've seen it time and time again in our market where um, our newspaper publishes interest rates and um, Dayton Mortgage Bankers, which is our uh, association for uh, the mortgage people in Dayton, have long tried to push the newspaper in a direction to not publish publish individual interest rates and costs in the newspaper, but to um, list the names of all the lenders and phone numbers, but just put an average cost uh, in the paper on a weekly basis. Well, they wouldn't do that because they like charging each individual uh, a large sum to advertise their rates in the paper. The unfortunate thing is, is they don't police it. Um, even though it's supposed to represent um, correct information, in other words, is this a fixed rate, are there any points, are there any origination fees, what are your closing costs? Time and time again, lenders lie about what their interest rates are, um, and National City, the company that I work for, pulled out of the Dayton newspaper publishing their interest rates because we'd always look like the highest because we were one of the few that did, that would refuse to uh, not embellish what our interest rates and costs were. Um, so the consumer is really getting swindled um, by not knowing that not everybody's going to tell them the truth when they call in. If if a um, if a disreputable mortgage company puts a, a low interest rate out there and, and, and gets a phone call and the individual wants to lock in that day, they just have to say, well, rates have gone up. Um, and then the consumer assumes, well, they were the lowest in the paper last week, even though the rates went up, they'll still be the lowest. So um, consumers are, are, are really putting themselves out there to be totally swindled by shopping for interest rates. They're so much better um, just finding out the one or two or three companies in town that have the great reputation uh, getting referrals from uh, maybe coworkers. Uh, hate to say real estate agents because, in in some respects, that gives them the opportunity to maybe push their mortgage company, and that might not be the best um, uh, the best possible sure. lender for them. Um, but they really need to realize that the company with the best reputation out there is maybe not going to be the lowest, but they're going to be close to. You know, they'll be in the market for sure, mm -hmm. you know, and you, that their service will be complete. Yeah. You're not the first person that I've interviewed that's brought this up. You're the first person that's brought it up in the tonality that you brought it in, which, interestingly enough, is how I feel about it, uh, because uh, <clears throat> my thing has always been that these things are called in on usually on Thursdays to get out in Saturday morning's paper, and it's very easy for someone to say, you know, when they call in, as you you suggested, more than suggested, that, uh, oh, gee, you know, if you just call me on uh, Thursday evening, then happy to give it to you, but now this is where we are. Uh, you see a version of that, too, and I, I actually don't want to steer you to it, but uh, on the Internet, where uh, some of the Internet players today, people that are going in and using the Internet as an informational source, uh, there's some of them are getting trapped uh, into loans where it looks on the face of it like they're saving money, but when they go in and if they were to compare a list of your closing costs, for example, that you would give them with the ones that they're getting on the Internet, that there's all these junk fees built in. And the reality of it is, is that there is no significant price differential. So it just doesn't happen in the newspapers. Well, and I, I, I think that um, the Internet brings up another question, another problem. Um, as much as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have really um, brought everything to um, uh, common ground, uh, pretty much in any area that you would be lending, um, people using the Internet for their mortgages are ultimately always going to pay more money because um, the uh, provider of the mortgage doesn't know anything about local customs, doesn't know who's responsible for paying what. For example, in, in Dayton, Ohio, um, it's assumed the buyer pays everything 
uh, in terms of closing costs and title insurance unless otherwise stated in the contract. Well, Columbus, Ohio, which is 90 miles away, the um, seller is responsible for providing um, lenders and owner's policy title insurance. Well, someone who doesn't do business in Columbus, Ohio, and is not going to know what the local customs are. They're not going to know title companies. They're not going to know um, uh, the local um, appraisers. Uh, it, it just makes absolutely no sense at all for individuals to um, uh, do business that way. Mm -hmm. They're much better off going with a local lender. Right, exactly. Um, uh, what advice would you give to, if we can steer it to the, our, our audience, what advice would you give to loan officers out there in, in uh, fighting some of this when uh, they get clients calling about Internet prices and, and some of the things that you've talked about? Well, I would first of all um, tell those individuals, if, if they get a phone call from an individual that says, well, I'm checking on the Internet, that um, that loan officer gets something in writing in terms of a good faith estimate from um, the institution that they're talking to. Mm -hmm. uh, apples and apples makes a whole lot more sense than uh, not knowing what they have to compare. So an individual should ask for a good faith estimate and be able to compare the, the total cost um, and, and fees, not just uh, verbal points and origination fees. And if, in fact, a company says that, well, I guarantee this rate to you, uh, the individual should be asking for it in writing. And there's a thing called a fax machine which is um, and email, which works very well to pass that information along. So I, I think any loan officer that is um, dealing with a client who says they're talking to someone on the Internet should advise those individuals and also themselves uh, send those individuals a good faith estimate so that there's a good comparison going on. Mm -hmm. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and that brings up a point that <clears throat> when you're fighting some of the Internet companies, that's where you really can win with them because when you do a side-by-side -side analysis, it's almost inevitable that their fees, are, they're going to have built-in junk fees and their fees are going to be a lot higher. Yes. Um, but uh, uh, in today's environment, I think that uh, it's just essential that uh, loan officers out there uh, be equipped to do this. Uh, I think a lot of people, just kind of loan officers out there, just kind of roll over to some of these Internet companies, and it's uh, really so unnecessary. Well, and I don't think a, a loan officer, um, and I fall into that trap the same as everyone else, depending upon what kind of a day I'm having and how many phone calls have come in, but I, I don't think... Um, a loan officer should ever, uh, when a client or when a customer calls, quote the interest rate just right out of the gate. I mean, they should get a little bit more information about the, the customer, what the customer's needs are, what type of loan program they're looking for, how long they think they're going to be in the house. Start developing that relationship before you start spitting out interest rates. Mm, that's a good point, and, and it's well taken. And it's well taken because a lot of loan officers, and I think even when I was producing, was guilty of it. Uh, people would call up and say, well, what's your 30-year fix today? And you're right. The first temptation is to say, well, we're at eight and a half and two points. Thanks. Goodbye. You know. Yeah, and, I, and, I've got another but, phone call to take. But. And right, exactly. And, and what do you have? You, you have nothing. Um, how about the, I, I, there's this, an area I want to talk about that is uh, increasingly uh, cropping up in the interviews today. Uh, you alluded to it, and it's the uh, kind of the nature of the beast out there that a lot of realtors are uh, getting their own mortgage subsidiaries or doing uh, you know business alliances. And I wondered if you maybe discuss that area. You have a lot of uh, experience out there in dealing with that and and how you parry that that threat out there. Um, well, it, it, it definitely, I um, believe, is, is not a good trend. Uh, of course, I would not think it is a good trend. Um, first of all, I think the customer is the one that ultimately ends up um, being sacrificed because in many cases they are, um, they are influenced by their real estate agent uh, just for pure lack of no one else to trust, and, and that's not saying they shouldn't trust their um, uh, should not trust their real estate agent, but it's a conflict of interest. Um, no matter what anyone says, there is some payback that's going on. 
um, and actually HUD should be looking at it a lot harder than they are, uh, unfortunately. Um, but, but there ultimately is a payback, and it uh, is sometimes is in terms of just keeping in good standing with your broker. In other words, these agents are being pressured on a daily basis to send business to um, their in-house uh, lenders with no regard to whether the customer is either getting the best service or uh, the best rate. And in many cases, these in-house institutions don't have all the programs that a regular mortgage company would have. And um, I think the loan officers that work for them get very lethargic in terms of any kind of customer service because they've got a captive audience. They get to the point where, you know, unless they're just a people person to begin with and, and really very diligent in their job over time, they take everybody for granted, the real estate agent, the customer, and I don't think the customer gets the best service, not to mention the fact that, um, you know, they're being enticed to send this business to these loan officers because their company is going to um, put them in a pool for a trip or they're going to buy the office computers or, you know, we've heard it all. And, and the long and the short of it is, it is not um, giving the consumer all the information. Well, you've, you've, you've stated the problem, and you've stated it really quite well. Uh, but what about the, for the audience out there, those people that have to fight that every day, what do you view as the solution uh, to the problem? How, how do loan officers uh, parry that? How do they get around that? And how do they fight this? Because you're right, it is an increasing phenomenon out there. Well, I think they need to make sure that their agents, even in these um, close uh, tied business relationships, be aware of the services that they have that these companies don't have. For example, if they have 203Ks, um, a lot of these in-house lending institutions don't care to have anything but vanilla products because they don't have to. They, you know, they can get fat and, and, and happy. Um, just doing uh, fixed and, a, and some easy adjustables day in and day out because they don't have to be ingenious. Um, many times it's just a matter of educating that agent and making sure that that agent knows that, gosh, there's not going to be every transaction that your in-house lender is going to be able to uh, provide you with. So remember me. Uh, for these other transactions, and I think as time goes on, these agents start to realize, well, gosh, uh, the people that are, are working for um, uh, our in-house um, mortgage company really can't provide all the services that I need, and they'll have a tendency to get more of, of uh, the non-traditional business, and then ultimately probably the traditional business because of that. What about the, another phenomenon that's happening out there where loan officers are really uh, being, for, for all practical purposes, are being denied access to the offices by a secretary up front, uh, uh, by a manager, and, uh, you know, it, it's very overt in some cases. Well, then I think you need to maybe um, send mailings to them independently, uh, call to make appointments with individuals. If If you have agents you've done business with for years, um, there's no reason why if you call them up and say, gosh, I'd like to meet with you on Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock 2 o'clock for a cup of coffee to tell you about a new program that has made some real estate agents extremely successful in, in this type of um, environment. Uh, I, I think they need to um, pull the, the agents away from the office. Is and I that think what, that helps. Mm -hmm. well, what about the concept, uh, if you would discuss a little bit about what you do to ensure uh, that you get what, what I call the first call. Uh, there's a, a theory in sales out there that since agents are required to give at least three names today, uh, that really what you want to do is maneuver yourself into a, a sales uh, relationship where you're getting the first call. And I wonder if you'd discuss that a little bit. Um, I don't... It, Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't feel that the first call is the most important. Okay. Um, tell, tell me why. Well, because um, wherever, you, whatever point in that list of names that you get the phone call, uh, I guess I ought to back up a little bit. Yes, if the first person they talk to really wows them, a lot of times they won't call the second and third person. But um, I think sometimes more than not being the last person, 
and them already having the information that they have and you being able to pull out the information that they have gives you a little bit more leverage in terms of picking the product that that would be best for them that you have the most advantage with. Um, a lot of times, again, I think the, the in-house lenders that they're going to call are going to be not so aggressive because they feel like, well, I've got the deal. I know my realtor really pushed me. I've got the deal. Um, I think if they have one or two or if you're the second phone call and the first phone call was a very uh, monotone, not so helpful, just gave out the interest rate type of individual, that you're going to look a whole lot better than the first phone call. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. Um, I, I guess that theory could be incorrect if, if you do have a situation where uh, the first phone call is a person that wows them. Yeah, well, I, I guess the ultimate answer is, is it's whatever works for you. Uh, it sounds like you're very articulate uh, over the phone and you don't have a problem getting a second you know, or third call. Uh, I've, I've had real estate. I, I had a realtor one time and I, I, I couldn't understand what what the, the problem was, but um, he gave his client my name um, about a pro, you know to call about a program. The customer called me, was not happy at all with the lender that he initially sent them to, uh, which was an in-house lender, um, and the customer and I built a rapport over the phone. The customer had not met with the other loan officer, but had uh, you know, passed some information and, and even locked in on a rate. I didn't quite understand that or she thought she had locked in on an interest rate, didn't know what was going on. Um, because generally, if somebody says they've already taken a loan application with another institution, I'm not too apt unless they're very dis dissatisfied or um, unless they're very insistent. I'm not going to encourage them to leave that. Sure. I don't like people taking business from me after I've done the work, and, and I don't do that to other people. Um, but in this particular situation, per the customer, a loan application had not been filed. They had not been happy with the service that they'd gotten so far. And, um, you know, the rapport was such that she said, you know, I'd really like to do business with you. So I called up the real estate agent and um, said, you know, I need you to fax me the contract, blah, 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 blah. Well, he was indignant. Well, they've already locked in with so-and-so. Well, the first words that I wanted to come out of my mouth were, why in the heck did you give my name if you didn't want me to get the business? Yeah, right, exactly. And that was they. The person apparently got a little bit belligerent with the customer as well, and the same words came out of the customer's mouth to me. Why in the heck did he give me your name if he didn't want you to have the business? Well, ultimately, that's what basically what I said to him. I said, if you don't want me to have the business, you better not have him call me, because, you know probably 89.90% of the time, I will get the business if they call me. So um, It that, sounds like a realtor uh, almost wasn't doing uh, his job out there. His well, he wasn't. Job. He yeah. wasn't. And, you know, the sad thing was is that he, he asked me about this client for weeks. So, of course, when the individual called me, I thought that he wanted me to have the business had no other reason but mm. thinking that he wanted me to have the business. Mm. Uh, I'd like to change uh, directions a little bit and um, ask you uh, if you get business, what I call outside of the box, and how you go about it. And by that, I mean uh, anybody but uh, realtors and new homes, uh, stockbrokers, CPAs, uh, and um, uh, if you address your comments with respect to the listeners out there who are looking to develop some alternative sources of business. Well, um, my alternative source of business comes from a networking group. Um, I'm involved in a networking group that um, allows only one individual from each business. Um, so in other words, there's a real estate agent, uh, myself, a, a traditional banker who just does banking services, um, insurance agents. There's 25 of us in the group. That's great. Tell and, me. And all we do is pass referrals to one another. That's, this is fabulous. Uh, I can't tell you how many times in an interview where I, I say legitimately uh, everybody brings one new idea to an interview, uh, and this is yours, and I really like this, and I wondered if you would uh, go into this in depth, I, because this is a great idea. Someone could go out and form their own networking groups. Well, there's there's already a group set up, um, and I don't know whether I'm allowed to 
say that on something like this? Well, as long as it's not, yeah, it, we don't want to know anything proprietary to your company. Uh, other than that, you can say whatever you say, whatever well, the heck not, you want. Well, it's not propri- proprietary to our company um, by any um, means. Uh, you know, I was bought in, brought into the group by a real estate agent and, um, in fact, a, a couple of other loan officers in our company have since been able to go into other chapters in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's a business uh, networking um, group uh, called BNI, and they sh- they're pretty much all over the country. And of course, it's it's really all a matter of the dynamics of your group. Um, I'm sure there are uh, groups, networking groups, that fail because the ultimate goal of the individuals is not to pass on. Um, referrals, but to, to just gain referrals. But our meeting is, is uh, totally set up with um, each individual in the group making sure that everyone in that group understands what type of business they're looking for and what they actually do. So if one of the members of the group is out at a dinner party and somebody says, I'm getting ready to uh, buy a home, uh, that individual from the group can say, well, here's an insurance agent, here's a realtor, and here's a mortgage loan officer. Or, um, you know, I'm looking for a job. We have a personnel person in our group. Um, but it's been a, uh, a relatively good source of, of business. Um, there is also an investment a financial planner in our group, so he will send people to me uh, from time to time to do second mortgages. But the the whole meeting is, again, um, individuals standing up and saying a little bit about who and what they do, um, you know, you know who their clients would be and, and, and what they do with, with their clients, and um, then passing around referrals and giving testimonies of each other's services. In other words, if, if I gave out uh, the name of an insurance agent, um, and the customer called me back and said, gosh, he did such a wonderful job, then I might give a testimony in our meeting, and we meet once a week. Yeah, this is this is really good because it, um, also, by extension, it, I'm sure it's a bit amorphous in the fact that uh, if you have a participant in the networking group that you don't feel is up to par, well, you simply can uh, and quietly just not refer anyone to them. So uh, it sounds like it's a, it can be self-correcting, too. It is. It is very much. Yeah, I, I like this idea. Uh, I, I like it a lot. And I think a lot of the listeners out there um, that are uh, uh, listening to this, uh, this, this is an excellent idea, either with an established group out there or going out and forming your own. And I have to tell you, the people that I interview, they're all very successful. They all do very well. Uh, they were all pretty much extroverted, uh, and most of the people out there would have no problem uh, taking an idea like this and, and really running with it. Uh, I, I have to believe for our listeners out there, the loan officers, uh, that you have to know people, as you say, that are uh, title agents, uh, uh, you know, car sales, any any amount that where you can get a basic uh, group going. That is that is very true. Yeah, I, I really like that, and I think uh, I think we're going to end the interview on. I told you I'd like to end it on a high point, and I think this is just an excellent idea, and I think our listeners out there uh, are, are going to really take to something like this. So I, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, to talk to us. It's uh, been wonderful, Joyce. Uh, you have a lot of experience. You have a lot a lot of good ideas for the people out there. And I think your comments in today's environment with the Internet and affiliated relationships are, are very much on point and uh, taking a heart out there. So thank you very much. Thank you.